2 uh, Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 3 through 6. Actually, 3 through 5. I'll just read a couple of verses. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I'm going to do the second sermon in my sermon series spiritual warfare and today's sermon is the battlefront the battlefront so father again i give you thanks and praise for this day what a wonderful time we have had in your presence and we look forward to our time together father in the rest of this service through the baptism father the lord and then our fellowship afterwards at our meal together so again we give you thanks in jesus name amen and amen I think everybody by now knows that I spent several years in the Army. I retired from the Army. Uh, I have gone through a lot of different things in training and a lot of different things just through procedure. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, one of the things that I saw very clearly in my training was is there's a big difference between being in a parade and being in combat. Big difference. In a parade, your weapon is not loaded. There is no enemy to be found unless it's your squad leader. And all your leader has to do is make sure you keep in step. However, when you are in war, your weapon is loaded. The enemy is in sight and your commander is telling you what you need to do in order to stay alive and win the battle. I'll be honest with you. I, I wonder sometimes how many believers view what they are going through as a parade or as in the war. If all we are interested is in keeping in step then we might be a parade soldier. How do we know if we are in a war? I'll tell you real quickly. There will be casualties and there will be prisoners of war. There are many believers, unfortunately, who have been taken captive by the enemy in either all or some areas of their lives. Last week we talked about the weapons of our warfare and they are living in truth Love, righteousness, and the prayer of faith. Soldiers are introduced to their weapons very early. Almost the very first day, they're introduced to their weapons. Because a soldier's weapon is what will help them to overcome the enemy. God has provided for us spiritual weapons to fight in a spiritual war. Sister Ruth was telling me a story about how she attended a memorial service not long ago for a young woman who had jumped off of the Aurora Bridge and committed suicide. She said at the service, everyone talked about how wonderful this lady was, how sweet she was, how kind she was. And then they started talking about how she took care of others and how good of a Christian lady she was. Yet this kind, good, wonderful woman took her own life. What could cause something like this, I wonder? What is it that would cause someone who is identified as a good Christian person to take their own life? We may never know the details of this person's life, but we can be assured of this. Satan has an agenda. The devil is at work. And it is his agenda to keep the world of unsaved unsa people under his control and render Christians ineffective in spiritual warfare, bringing us down to defeat. And I want to talk to you just a few minutes this morning about how he does that. Now, there are four fronts of attack that the enemy uses to attack the people, and especially the people of the church. And the first one is, is the individual. Say that with me, the individual. And I think before we can really even understand the individual front, we must first have a good definition of what a stronghold is. We've heard this word. Maybe you've heard this word many times, stronghold. A stronghold really is just an argument and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, Satan makes you believe 
that there is no hope for you or the situation that you are facing. Satan has convinced you that you will never be an overcomer, that you will always have to live the life that you're living. You will always be bound up in that sin. You'll always have that condition. You'll always be that way. There is no hope. You might as well just stop trying and give in to whatever it is that's going on in your life. That is a stronghold. And he uses it to keep us incapacitated. He uses that stronghold to keep us from achieving anything for the glory of God. I'm going to tell you something this morning. Satan is after every one of us. If you call yourself a child of God, Satan's after you. And the closer you walk to God, the more powerful you feel in the presence of the Lord, the more powerful the enemy will try to bring you down. No matter whom you are or what status you have, he wants to overthrow and defeat you. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober and watchful because your adversary, the devil, walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And it says there, and I think what's important about that, as. He's not really that, but he projects himself as that. And if we see him as that, if we believe him as that, then we find ourselves in danger. But I'm here to tell you right now, Satan has no control over the child of God. Oh, he may, he may have some influence in some things. He may push some buttons. He, he, he may oppress us. But I'm going to tell you right now, he has no authority, nor does he have any real power over you. We are children of the Most High God. And it is time we start walking as children of the Most High God. We need to tell the devil where to go. Can I get away with that? Uh, be careful. <laughs> If someone here this morning is struggling with addictions, and, and listen, listen, please understand that no one here is judging anyone. But for the grace of God, but for the grace of God, I could find myself in many situations. And you don't know my life completely anyway, do you? I got one amen. None of us are here to judge an addiction or a life controlling issue. But I'm here to tell you right now, this is how Satan keeps us prisoners of war. And the devil has set up a stronghold in our lives. Man, it is time to see the strongholds pulled down. Can somebody shout amen? It's time to see those things broken in our lives so that we can get free. You know, I can hear the chains falling. If someone is struggling this morning with fear, discouragement, depression... Oh, a whole, there's a whole host of other problems that we could list. Then you just might have a stronghold in your life. Oh, I want every person to hear so clearly this morning that no matter what the issue might be, no matter what the, the thing that's going on in your life might be, Christ can be an overcomer in your life today. I, I, I worry sometimes, and I know even worry is bad, right? But I'm concerned sometimes of, just how many of God's children are bound up in fear, discouragement, depression. Man, if, if the devil can keep, let me ask you this question. If the devil can keep me fearful, then how effective will I be in spiritual matters? Somebody help me out. Not very? Because you see, if fear dominates my life, if discouragement dominates my life, then I'm not going to be much spiritual help to many because I'll be concentrating on what? My anxieties, the things that are hindering me. And right in front of me may be someone that needs hope. There might be someone right in front of me that needs deliverance. Who captures what I'm saying? And the devil wants to keep us under his hand and say, you will not be an overcomer. I want every person here to know fear should not be a part of our life. Anxiety should not be a part of our lives. The pastor, I get nervous. Yeah, it's, maybe it's okay to get nervous on occasion, but we cannot let our nervousness control our lives. Can somebody shout amen? We must understand that Christ comes to give us victory over these things. And this is how the devil keeps the individual pulled down into these strongholds. We also find the family front. We had the individual front, 
And then we come to the family. If being an individual in the kingdom of God is not bad enough, you know, at least when it comes to the things of the devil, when the devil's trying to beat us down, then we have the family front that the devil loves to beat us up with. Anybody have family? Anybody got a spouse or an aunt or an uncle or a brother or a sister or any of those, all of the above? When you were a kid, did you ever have the aunt that wanted to kiss you all the time, you know? Did you have, did you have her, you know? Grab you by the face and go, ooh! Or the uncle, you know, that would make funny noises and embarrass you to death? We're, we're, Han and I were talking about how teenagers can be grumpy. I know that that's, doesn't happen, but we were talking about how teenagers can get moody and grumpy. And I remember one time Han and I were in Sears or J.C. Penney's, one of those, and we're standing there talking about underwear. We're looking at the rack of underwear and we're talking about underwear. And my oldest daughter comes along and goes, you guys are so embarrassing. <laughs> you know, underwear is a part of life, right? <laughs> you know? But the devil loves to take these things as families, Right? as families and keep families beat up, neurotic, ineffective. Man, it is time that we understand that the devil wants to attack families. If he can get his hand on the family, man, he's got it. And listen, it doesn't, listen to me very carefully. It doesn't have to be that my brother is strung out on heroin. And that's serious and we should be praying over that. But it could be that I had an argument with somebody coming to church this morning. Over which lane to drive in? Why are you driving that way? Drive this way. Well, I'll tell you who's the driver of this car. Well, I'll show you. I'll just drive in this lane. And by the time you get to church, where, where's your spirituality at? It's gone. And when the pastor says something, you get elbowed. Did you get that? <laughs> Come on. It doesn't have to be something that we look at and say is catastrophic. But I'm going to tell you right now, come to church with your mind on the argument that you had with your spouse on the way to church. And it's catastrophic. Because God wants to use every person here to touch the kingdom of God. <laughs> Arguments. And those silly things. That we, I'm going to tell you some of the arguments that we can get into sometimes. Aren't they silly? It's just amazing to me some of the silly arguments that families can get into. It's also bad when you get into an argument and then not talk to your loved one for years. And then you get down the road and you say, why aren't I talking to John any longer? I can't remember. But I'm not talking to him because I don't like him too much. That destroys the body of Christ. Who would agree? It destroys. God's kingdom is not being built when we're arguing with one another. And families can be the worst. Isn't it amazing how families can be the worst on each other? Come on, Engelick. It is time that families started loving one another. Under the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. Can somebody help me out this morning? I think also I want to talk a little bit here too about generational cycles. Because I feel like this is a part of what the devil does to keep us down. Now listen, I believe in generational curses. I like to call them generational cycles. Because the Bible talks about them. All right. However, I think we have to be careful that we don't walk around saying, Well, Uncle Bob was like that, so I'm like that. Now that there might be some truth to that, but I don't have to be like Uncle Bob. I can be free from that. Can somebody shout amen? I think one of the worst, listen, one of the worst examples I saw of generational cycles or generational curses, when we were in Oakville, I had a young girl that came to me one time, and she was devastated about some things that were going on in her life, and she had been disfigured because her father had shot her in the face when she was just a child. So she was horribly disfigured, okay? And she came to me, and she was telling me about some troubles that she was going through, and I was trying to help her. And I asked her, I said, how many siblings do you have? She said, I have seven. I said, wow. 
So do they all have the, is, it was the father that shot you? Oh, she said, oh no, all seven have different fathers. One mother, seven different fathers. It's a clear example of horrible drug abuse where someone's had to sell their bodies to have the money to have their habit. I thought to myself, what a horrible life. But then I found out, check it out, I found out that her mother's mother had seven children. And guess what? All different fathers. That's a generational curse. That's a generational cycle where you get into these things and they just perpetuate themselves over and over and over again. Man, I want to tell everybody that's in this building right now, just because mommy was like that, you don't have to be like that. Just because daddy was like that, you don't have to be like that. Somebody shout amen. amen. There, there was, a, there was a, a man that went to China. This missionary goes to China and he's doing the missionary work. And he comes upon this young man who's in a ditch and the man is horribly intoxicated. And he picks him up out of the ditch and he takes him home. He gets him sobered up and he just begins to minister to him and help him and talk to him. He begins to tell him how much Jesus loves him. And he eventually leads this young man to Jesus. And the young man was telling him, said, my father was a drunk. My grandfather was a drunk. My great grandfather was a drunk. Alcohol is just a big part of our lives. But he led this young man to Jesus. And then shortly after that, he came back to the United States. 20 years later, he goes back to China and he meets this young man. And now this young man is the pastor of the church and his children are all serving Jesus. I want to tell you right now, God can break generational curses, but we need to understand and know that our hope is not in some program. Our hope is in Christ Jesus. Our hope is in the blood of the lamb. Listen, I don't have an answer for you outside of Jesus. I might be able to give you some encouragement. I might be able to give you some, some points to take. And I might be able to help you to understand some things. But until we get a hold of Jesus or until he gets a hold of us, I'm here to tell you there's not much hope. There is hope in Christ Jesus. Can somebody shout amen? amen. Fighting, disagreements, personality conflicts, preferences are all strongholds that Satan loves to use to keep families in bondage. The third front is the church front. Oh, pastor, Satan can't have any influence over the church, can he? Shouldn't. He shouldn't. But unfortunately, we, things will get into our lives. God would love to see the family of God split up because he understands that God will not work in disunity. God only works where there is harmony in the body of Christ. Can I get an amen? It is disunity and division and personality squabbles, power struggles, doctrinal errors, racism, culturalism. These are all the devices that Satan uses to keep churches bound up and in a stronghold. These also in a church can become generational cycles too in a church. One of my favorite guys to listen to preach is Mark Rutland. You've heard me say that many times. Love to listen to Mark Rutland preach. And he loves to tell the story of how he was in a church service one time. And the church was deciding over whether to have blue carpet or red carpet. Now, this is way back in the days when you had just one color of carpet, not like what we... See, when you have a carpet like this, it's hard to get in disagreement over. But back in the day, if it was going to be blue or red, there could be some discussions. So the church is having discussions one afternoon about what color carpet. Do we do blue or do we do red? And it was starting to get a little heated. I know it's hard to believe, but a little heated in church over what color to have the carpet. Because they wanted it to be a consensus agreement. When suddenly a lady in the back stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord God! Red, not blue, red. Can I just help everybody out? God's not that concerned about what color the carpet is. But you know what I'm saying? How often do we get twisted over things like carpet color? How, how often do people in the church, I've seen people leave the church over things and you wonder what's going on. I went to a church service one time, big church, several thousand. And they had radio chairs and concrete. But man, the power of God was in that house and the altars were full. Ready chairs and concrete. Listen, I'm not, I, I don't think God is all that concerned about what we're sitting on, necessarily what we're, we're standing on. 
I think God is concerned about what's on the inside of our hearts. Can somebody shout amen? amen? And if we get into those silly squabbles over things like that, it will destroy the work of God. Who hears what I'm saying? Besides, just, just put somebody, one person in charge and give them all the authority and let them go with it. Amen? <laughs> I'll see you after church. The fourth front is society front. Satan loves to exert his influence over the world and the world structures. Sometimes we think that we can make a difference by who we would vote for into political office. Now listen, please understand, it's very important to be a good citizen. Can I, hear, can I get an amen? amen. I, I had a fellow tell me one time, he says, I don't vote because voting is not in the Bible. Well, did you know that Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament? The Apostle Paul? And he all the time talked about being a good citizen. Anybody here want to be a good citizen? Being a good citizen in our environment means to be involved in those decision-making things. But I, what I want you to grab hold of on this is that we are foolish to think that all of our spiritual problems or any of our spiritual problems are going to be fixed by some political party. It's, it's just foolish to think of it in that way. Can we vote in somebody in power that we think will help us in things? Yes, and we should. In fact, I would suggest to you we need more men and women of God to run for political office. Can I get an amen? We need more, not less. More. We need more of good Christian people that will get involved in the civil things of this world. But I'm telling you right now, if we think and put our hope in a political party or a man or a woman, we're not, we're not thinking correctly. Because only God can help us in any of these areas. And listen, this is what I want you to hear. We are not commanded to fix the world. Can I get an amen? No one here is commanded to fix the world. We're told to go out and be salt and light. To make disciples. To share the gospel. Because the world is coming to an end as much as maybe several of us might not want to hear about that. But should we be involved? Absolutely. Because Satan's involved. And we need light where there's darkness. Somebody shout amen. amen. But just don't put your hope in it. Because you'll be horribly disappointed. I want to take a moment and look at Satan's methods of attack. If our struggle is indeed by our flesh, then we cannot win the fight. You can spend all the time and effort and resources trying to fix the problems, and at best, all you will achieve is a band-aid on a situation. To find a cure for our struggle, we must choose a spiritual response. If our battle is a spiritual battle, then it needs a spiritual cure. Listen, you cannot fight cancer with skin lotion. Satan targets his attacks on our mind, on our thinking. He builds these strongholds in our thinking by trying to make us believe we can overcome our struggle. You can't overcome this problem no matter, no, no way you, can, you can't save your children, you can't unify your church, nor can you make a difference in your community. The worst thing you can hear is our struggle is no way can it be done. I've tried everything and it just doesn't work. I want everybody to hear this morning that that's not the mindset to have. Our mindset should be, I can be an overcomer through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I can pray God reach down and minister to families and individuals, to churches. Come on. How many of you are praying for Angle Lake Neighborhood Church? How many of you are praying, God, let revival fall. Let the lost be saved. Let the demon possessed be delivered. Let those that are bound up be set free. Come on, church. If we'll begin to pray and see God's hand move, we can see a change affected. But I, I just wonder how much we're trying to do humanistic things to get things changed. Not that I say that there's, you, you can do all kinds of humanistic things and they may look good. But I want to see the power of God fall. Can somebody shout amen? amen. Part of Satan's plan is to keep us thinking wrong is by raising up high things. Another word for high things is a partition or a wall. Satan desires that we become double-minded Satan tries to get God's people to divide their thinking. God on one side, non-God things on the other side. I am, I am truly convinced that there are people that believe I live for Jesus on Sunday, but I live in the world the rest of the week. I, I'm convinced that people have divided, put a petition, petition in their minds, and they'll say, this is for church, this is for non-church. And they walk in that. And they think, as long as I'm not in church, I can do whatever I want to over here, and it's okay. Man, I got news for you. 
It should be Jesus Christ 24-7, 365. It should be His glory and His plan for my life. It's the devil that puts this petition in our mind that says I can be this on one day and this on another. Listen, if it's wrong on Sunday, it's still wrong the rest of the week. If it's not glorifying God on, on Sunday, then it's not glorifying God the rest of the week. Come on. And what I do on Sunday to glorify God should be in my life Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. In everything that I do. Who here believes that it's time to see the partitions torn down in the church of Jesus Christ? Satan does not desire for us to take the, the word of God seriously. If we take God at his word and live our lives that way, it will crush Satan. I'm here to tell you right now, if we would just believe what this word says and follow it and honor it, it would crush Satan. He cannot stand up under its power. Satan cannot stand up under the worship of Jesus Christ. Satan cannot stand up under the glory of God. Satan is not the equal of God. God is God and Satan is not. And he has no power or authority except for that that we give him. Satan loves to, to have this thought process and it's time that the church stood up and understood who we are. Satan's attack plan is to divide our thinking and to keep us from obeying God and having the victory. But we are instructed on how to, to counter attack. And I want to talk about that just quickly, the counter attack. We are told to tear down fortresses. Our weapons in doing that are spiritual di di disciplines, prayer, reading God's word, obedience, meditation on scripture, fasting and service. We are to tear down these high things that keep us from God's truth. We must refuse by the power of the Holy Spirit to listen to Satan's lies and put our hope and trust in God's truth. Can somebody shout amen? amen. I know this is going to sound funny. I've actually had some people come and tell me I'm wrong, but it's okay. But I don't believe for one minute that Satan can read my thoughts. Only God knows what I'm thinking, but not Satan. You say, then how does he know so much about me? Because he watches what you do. He just pays attention to you. And you give away all your secrets in the things you see, in the things you hear, in the things you tolerate, in the things you say, the places you hang out, the people you see. Satan doesn't have to read your mind. You're an open book. You show everything to everyone, whether you want to believe that or realize that at all. But he, is, he does not read our thoughts, but he can influence our thinking. And this is why we are commanded to take our thoughts captive. When the enemy sends a thought your way, recognize it for what it is and take it hostage. Somebody shout amen. amen. When you get a thought that does not sound like God's thought or you know goes against God's will, don't entertain it. Amen. When we can do this successfully day in and day out, we're going to start winning some serious spiritual victories in our lives. Stop allowing Satan to influence over your thinking. We must tear down strongholds. God's way, not our way. If we're going to be successful in our counterattack, we must know root causes of the problem and not just a symptom. What's the root cause of the problem? Sin. Say it with me. Sin. It simply is, my friend, sin. And here's the cure. James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Somebody shout amen. amen. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you're double-minded. Grieve and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to dejection. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Believe it or not, believe it or not, and I hope you're writing this down. Believe it or not, the best weapon in spiritual warfare that you can have is to stop sinning and repent. Stop sinning and repent. Take the offense of sin and confess before God that you are struggling with and ask it, ask for forgiveness. Then ask God to clothe you in his righteousness and be set free. You see, when we humble ourselves and mourn over our sin, God will reach down and comfort us. God doing for you what you can't do for yourself. Satan cannot stand up to the grace of God. Somebody shout amen. amen. If we're going to see victories in the battle, we must face the enemy. Then we are going to need to pray like soldiers in God's army. We need to identify those strongholds that are in our lives, our families, our churches, and our community, and start using God's word through the power of the Holy Spirit to crack the foundations of hell. Who wants to storm the foundations of hell? 
Who wants to see Satan and his kingdom crumble and fall? Who wants to see people delivered and set free? Come on. It is time to take the battle to Satan and stop being passive in this thing and start saying, Thus saith the Lord God, and start asking God to heal, deliver, set free, take captive every thought that comes into our heart and mind, and be the people that he's called us to be. Why? Because in 1 John 4 it says, He who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Somebody shout glory. Worship team, come back. The baptismal candidate and the pastors can prepare for the baptism. I came across this story and I thought it sounded like something I would do. A husband and bride were escorted to their bridal suite in an eloquent hotel in the wee hours of the morning. They were tired from the many hours at their wedding reception and from mingling with their guests. They took a look around their room and they saw a sofa, a chair, and a table. But where was the bed? This was the bridal suite, right? Then they discovered that the sofa was a hideaway bed, complete with lumpy mattress and spring sagging to the floor. They unfolded it and spent their wedding night, a frightful night, <laughs> on that hideaway bed, waking up the next morning with sore backs. Boy, the next morning that new husband marched himself down to the front desk, and he went up to the management, and he gave them the tongue lashing that they deserved for giving them such a horrible room for their wedding night. And the manager looked at the young man and said, Sir, did you open the door that was there? The young man stopped talking, did an about face, and went back upstairs to his room and walked in and opened up the door that was there. And behind the door was a beautiful room with a wonderful bed, <laughs> basket of fruit, chocolates, roses. It was beautiful. And they had spent the night on a lumpy hideaway sofa bed. And I, that's funny, I know. But I wonder, how often do we settle for just anything? How often do I settle and say, this is just the cards I've been dealt I wonder how often do we say this is just the life that I've got to live? You know, Pastor, I've got this thing, this sin in my life. I've, I've tried everything. Oh, I've tried everything. I have fasted and prayed. I've gone to counseling. Man, I've tried everything. And yet I just can't get over it. It just, it's a cycle that just repeats itself. I think in our minds, we've come to the belief that nothing can help, no one can help, not even God. And I want to ask everybody here this morning this question. I want to ask everyone here this question. What is it that you're settling for? What, what is it that you've said, okay, this is just life the way it is. These are just the cards that I've been dealt, and I'll play them. Man, if that's you, and you want more, anybody want more than that? Anybody want more? I'll raise both hands. Anybody want more than that? I want more than just the cards I've been dealt. I want to see the glory of God fall in all parts of my life. Man, I no longer want sin to have dominion over me. Somebody shout amen. I no longer want situations to have dominion over me. I no longer want that family cycle, that family curse to follow me the rest of my life. Anybody want to be set free? Man, if you want to be set free, raise your hands towards the sky right now. I just want to be set free. Set free. Set free. Set me free, Lord God. Set me free from anxiety and worry, depression. Set me free, Lord God, from anger. Set me free, Lord God, from disillusion, discontentment, grumpiness. Set me free this morning, Lord God, from wrong thinking. Set me free this morning, Lord God, from those things that have hindered and held me back. Set me free. Set me free. Set me free. Set me free. 
Let the blood of the Lamb come over and wash me and set me free. While your hands are still raised, let's just sing the Lord and give him worship and praise right now, all over the building.